I say to you today, as many of you as are sitting in this meeting, what is it that has weakened your marriage? Contention. Wives, some of you don't understand. Your attitude first is to contend. Even when you now finally succumb, you don't know that you have already wounded a brother. To win him back is a problem. You can cook, you can pan yam. You say, what have I done? Say, eh. When are you coming on? say, well. Sometimes they are preachers. They are preachers. I'm telling you, they are preachers. Good preachers. But because you are always contending with them, it goes to form a pillar. Like a castle. So what do you do? Avoid what? Offense. Excuse me, what is offense? Offered fence. What did I call offense today? Offered fence. It becomes a fence when it has been offered and you collect it. Don't take offense. What did I say you should not do? You are not hearing me. What did I say you should not do? You see, it is not that they should not offend you. People are free. Are you hearing me? To offer you offense. It only becomes a problem when you do what? When you take it. Don't take offense. Don't capitalize on words. That can bring contention. Honestly speaking, what do I want you to do? To build a strong marriage? To become a man of God? You know, I was happy when you were reading your vows and you said you are praying to be a man of valor. Abi? Now, a man of valor, if I were to define it to you, is a man of focus. A man of valor. Is a concentrated man. What makes him a man of valor is that he is concentrated. He is not diverted. Little things don't enter his heart. He doesn't pick quarrels. He doesn't keep repeating. He didn't like this. He didn't like this. He didn't do this. He didn't do this. No. A man who wants to be great don't have time for such things. He can swallow offense and never act from the ground of offense. Hallelujah. Are we together? Don't take offense. Don't take offense with Chile. Favor, are you hearing me? What did I say you should not do? Don't take offense with him Don't take offense with his people. You are stepping into a cross-cultural marriage. Are you hearing me? Thief land is not equal to Igbo land. It's not the same. There are things that are peculiar here. Don't take offense at it. Eh? Somebody may walk into the house. And you are expecting them to respect you and first say, excuse, excuse. And it just comes in. Say, who is that? Who is that? Don't take offense. That's where you have married. You are not hearing me at all? Eh? In Tivland, fence, fence is an offense. Are you here? No, no, no. You have to hear me very well. A thief man believes that everywhere belongs to him. Including your sitting room. And if your bedroom has a passage, he could pass through it. I'm sorry. You know I'm here now. These 30 years I've been here. So I'm a thief man inside, you know. I know it. So the question is this. 
When people come to you, they may even appear as if they are they are looking at you and say, why, 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 why are you asking us questions? They are simply exercising their liberty. They just say, we have, we have accepted you. Are you understanding? That's what they are saying. But you are coming from a place where everybody lives in a fence. Where everybody minds his business. Where achievement is the key matter. What have you achieved? What have you achieved? But in Tiefland, achievement is not an issue. In fact, if you come with big money, it doesn't say, what does he have? You say, he doesn't even respect me, I'm a professor. And so what? It is in Ibo land, you will call somebody professor, professor, doctor, so and so, and you are very excited. Here, they just, it's a professor, they just say, Terumu. <laughs> it will appear as if they don't recognize that. Because to them, that's not the basis of relationship. Achievement is not the basis of relationship in Tivland. So sometimes you say, oh no, no, they don't even respect somebody. Don't look for it. Don't take offense. Don't take offense with your husband's people. Belong to them freely. Begin to learn the language. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk to them. But I must talk to you first. Chile. Don't forget. That you went. A long distance. You know I asked you before you went. I said are you sure you really really want to marry an evil girl? You said God has convinced you now. Abi, now that you have traveled, you didn't pick her from backyard. She's not an EPF girl. She's from Okunonu. I might communicating with you now. Take note that you have a divine responsibility. To culture, to nurture, to give her a sense, not of a stranger. You are the only one that can do that. Anyone else will not be able to because they don't know how to. It begins with the language. You know, I was watching you the other day, the two of you. This one is on phone, that one is on phone. This one is speaking Igbo, this one is speaking Thief. I say, God, I'm going to collect this answer from these boys. <laughs> That's the first orientation you are going to have. Hallelujah. When they call you and they are speaking in Thief, and your wife has to know what they are saying, answer in English. A contention between a brother is difficult to, to, to repair. Don't give room for suspicion. When they are calling you from the other side and you are speaking Hebrew, rata, 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 don't forget that somebody is waiting here, lying down, wondering what are they talking about and when will they stop. And then, when you switch off and you say, wait, 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 he say, Biko, Biko, let's leave that one. He say, what is Biko? He doesn't understand. Can you deliberately now sit back and say, God, this relationship will work. I'm not going to take offense. I'm going to open my heart. I have said that you must nurture this marriage well. We are entering into new experiences and we are trusting that God will cause it to produce results in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Hey, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Somehow the Lord is very peculiar in speaking to you today. And it looks like there's something about communication that you must work at. For many husbands, I'm trusting that God will help your communication. The biggest problem that I have seen in many, many marriages outside their sexual problems is the problem of mouth, mouth, communication. How you talk. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. I, I thought they would say a man's belly will be satisfied with the fruit of his labor. I thought that that was what they were going to say. Only to discover that actually a man can work hard. But his mouth will not let him eat it. A man can, can be so hard working. But because he doesn't know how to handle his lips, much of his labor are wasted. So can I beg you, in your home, in your home, deliberately decide that you will bless, bless each other. Speak comfortably to one another. Speak simply. Speak in such a manner that the other person is encouraged. Speak in such a manner that there can be life being released. Let grace be found in every word that comes out of your mouth. Every time you speak, before you let it go out, ask yourself, of what grace is what I want to say? One of the things I'm talking to you about is this. If somebody is bad, eh? my question, what I ask myself is that, what do I gain by telling you, you are bad? What does that do? Say, yes, I tell people what they are. I tell people what they are and so what? You tell people what they are and so what? What a person is, he knows. You don't need to tell him. Am I right? So when you speak, every word that comes out of your mouth must come with what? Grace. That's what the New Testament says. said, let every word that comes out of your mouth be seasoned with salt and let it minister grace to the hearers. I'm asking myself, what do I gain if I abuse you? It's only childishness. Am I communicating with you? It's childishness. That's what we did when we were babies. When someone said, Hey, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. That's childish. If somebody did me like that and say, Waka, your mother, your father, excuse me. What he says, does he affect my mother? Why not? He doesn't. My mother, my father, they are dead. You are abusing them. You are wasting your time. But now, I make myself childish. When I also say, you also, you also, you also. Now, that's when I become a child. The reason is because. So, what am I doing now? How does that change what he said? Eh? I was talking to a brother the other day. I said, mm -mm. the spirit of vengeance is troubling you. He opened his mouth. He said, how? I said, I can see you every time. Somebody speak. You cannot allow anybody to say something that is not palatable to you and he will go scoffering. 
If you don't have opportunity to respond, you may keep quiet. But the next time you have chance, you will look for something that will pain that man. That's childishness. You don't do that. The fruit of your lips will fill your, your stomach with satisfaction. How many of you know what I'm saying? Do you know that any time you spoke bad words or roughly to somebody, when the person has gone, what happens to you? Talk to me. Answer me. You feel bad. You feel little. You feel small. In fact, something tells you, say, why are you, why are you like that? He said, hey, don't you see how you talk to me? Don't you see how I say, how did he talk to you? So in your home, communication must be gracious. Be gracious with your words. Eh? Don't be judgmental. Judgment brings judgment. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, the measure with which you judge people, people will judge you. Please, as you grow and as you go forward, may the Lord grant you understanding this in the name of Jesus. Whoso finds a wife, finds a good thing and obtain a favor of the Lord. I don't need to re- repeat that to you. You already have your favor, have you? Yes. May the Lord release that favor to you. And pray that you will bear your name in his life. Pray that you will favor him. And that by your life, you will come into favor. That by your stepping into his life, the favor of the Lord will fill your lives and your family. I'm ending in verse 23. And 24. And it's very important. And I'm begging you all. And I'm begging Chile particularly. To take note. When the Lord asks me to bring this word. I'm saying God. What do you want? He says that's what he needs. I need to give instructions. Fatherly instructions. That will keep you going. For the rest of your lives. The poor. Uses entreaties. But the rich answers how? Roughly. See, how does that enter marriage? How does that enter marriage? The poor. And who is the poor? Let me inform you this afternoon that the poor. He's not the man that has no money. Honestly speaking, it is a misunderstanding to think that those who have money are not poor. There are many people that have money, but they are poor people, poor souls. I don't like to be like them. I don't have money, but I don't have a sense of poverty because I don't have money. Poverty is a spirit. It has nothing to do with money. Are you understanding? Those who are poor, who have the spirit of poverty, even when you give them one million, they are still begging. You know why? Something tells them, this million will soon finish. When it finishes, what will you have now? I'm not talking about those kind of poverty. I want to talk about the poor in spirit. Those who recognize that they don't know. Those who recognize their need. Their need of God and their need of one another. If you marry a man that has no need of you, you are in trouble. If you marry a man that thought you are just an addendum to him, ah, what can you do to please him? He answers how? Roughly. 
But when a man begins to sense, I have a need. I need a woman in my life. I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to make me fulfill the call of God on my life. I need somebody to stand with me so that I will not die alone. Then, you have a correct husband. I'm not sure many husbands are here that are so poor. Many husbands, they think, well, you should actually thank your God that I married you. If I don't marry you, where will you have been? Eh! I'm afraid of such men. I meet many of them on the road. The way they treat their wives shows that they have not sensed a need. They have not known that without this woman, I'm going nowhere. The poor what does he do? He uses entreaties. May I tell you that it is no weakness that makes you to beg. It is wisdom. Hallelujah. It is not weakness that makes a man, a man of God like me, to beg. I don't beg for money, but I beg for mercy. I don't beg for clothes, but I beg for divine help. I know if God will not help me, I'm finished. I know that. And I'm not being humble by telling you that. That is the reality. I'm a poor man. I'm poor in my spirit. I need help. And it was this need in my own life that I said, oh God help me. He said, I have packaged your help in Sister Shade. I said, God, are you sure? He said, yes. You know, you mean that all the help I will be needing, this woman will be elastic enough to provide it. God said, yes. Hallelujah. A poor man uses what? Entreaties. Simple words. It's not that you couldn't stand and do like that and say, yes, I'm your husband here. But yes, your husband, when you do like that, I don't see husband. I see horseband. H-O-R-S-E band. You know, that's the horse riders. Abby? Uh, may God help you, husbands. That the need for a wife in your life is not the sense of lack of qualification. It's because there is something indispensable that you need that you don't have that she carries. That's why we use entreaties. We don't use rough language because we know we don't have what it takes to go far. When you honor your wife out of a sense of need, out of a sense that, look, this woman is a necessity in my life. I must not let her go. I realize. Let me tell you, this meal I don't know about someone else. I know. People pray for me everywhere. And I praise God for their prayers. And I really appreciate the prayers of many, many people. But you know there's something I discovered that makes me very helpless. I found that if you pray for me, that's okay. If you don't pray for me, if you don't, even if you don't agree with me, it doesn't carry much consequence. But there is one that if she does not agree with me over any matter, because she's a co-signatory to my account in heaven, 
my check will bounce. Who is that? That's my wife. So when I go to his brother, we are praying for you. Hey, yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Hey, man, go ahead. I'm looking at home. I said, is she really with me in this? If she does her head like this, I know I'm going nowhere. I will cancel a meeting to make sure we agree together. Nothing is big. I will suspend anything to make sure we are going together. I don't have such a strength to move and say, well, if you don't agree, I'm going. I'm going. Where am I going? I can't go anywhere. I was traveling, I told you, Tom, sometimes to Yida to go and preach. I had got my load ready, everything set. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Yida now. There's a meeting, and you know I'm a man of my word. When I promise people I will be there, I will be there. My wife said, hmm. This journey. Are you sure you should go? I said, yes, I must go. He said, well, I believe you are going, you can go, but I don't think you should go. Ah. Very energetic man of God that I was. What did I do? <laughs> I jumped in the car. Nasrin was with me that time. I said, Nasrin, yeah, park the car. Let's move. We started traveling. You know, we traveled. We got to Otupo. I was entering the Benue bricks, burnt bricks. The Lord said, Where are you going? I said, I'm going to Ida. You know, there's a meeting they are going to start so, so, and so time. He said, eh, You are going. He said, They are asking for you at Omo. <laughs> I said, God, so what do I do? He said, Turn, 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 go back. I drove back. I drove straight. I was getting to her bedroom. She was there crying to God. When I knocked, she looked. Are you back? I said, they said, <laughs> you have not released me. He said, he said thank God. He said, I would have been confused if you went. So I started pleading. I said, but you know, I need to go. The people are looking. He said, no, it's not that I don't want to go, but I don't think there's a meeting there. I said, but I promised them. Let me just go. Then this time, the following day, she released me. She said, you can go. But may the Lord take you through and bring you back. So she prayed with me. I'm not sure she was convinced that there's a meeting. So I went. We drove. The road was terrible that time. It's not like now. We went for hours. You know the red dust of Igala land. I was so red. When I got to Ida Polytechnic where I was going to preach. The school was closed. Nobody was there. The students that were inviting me to come and preach. They had disappeared. So I met their president and said, Ha! Uncle! You came. We sent a message that you should not come. <laughs> so they didn't tell you. Ah, you know the school was closed. And so we started looking for her to tell you not to come again. Did I sit down? I just put my car in reverse. Coming back. Coming back. I came back in the middle of the night. I'm knocking. Sister Shade was there. Welcome. What happened? There was no meeting. You know what she did? She didn't say, Shabia, I told you. Next time when I talk to you, listen. She didn't do that. A correct wife don't boast over her husband even when he has been found to be at fault. You don't rejoice over the mistake of your husband. Say, so Shabia, I told you. Mm-mm. She got me hot water to bath. She got food for me. She got me to rest. She said, thank God that you came back safely. 
Since you left, I was restless. I just felt that there's something wrong about that journey. But since you talk about integrity, that's why I said, okay, you should go. Those days when I'm traveling, you know, I will take whatever salary she has. I'm using it to travel. Sometimes she will go to the bus coral market. What's the bus coral market? Okrika shop. To buy blouse for two naira. Medical doctor. A sister came one day to the hospital and looked at my wife wearing what kind of what are you wearing at that time? One spare 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 like this. And she looked at her. Say, doctor, this kind of Christianity is turning your head. What kind of shoe is this? She came back, she cried. I also cried. But I knew why with all her salary. She is going to be wearing pespes because we must serve God. Don't I need, don't I have a need in my life? The poor man uses entreaties. When you recognize the need of your life as a man, I'm telling you, all men have a need. It's not good for you to be alone because you won't succeed alone. You look nice, but you are not going far without the woman that God is bringing in your life. If you know that and you are poor, you will use entreaties. You won't be speaking roughly. But the one who feels is rich, who thinks he has everything, how does he answer? He answers roughly. Your language reveals your heart. May God help us. Wives, are you hearing me? You are not hearing me this morning. Are you hearing me? Don't use rough language. Only those who think they are rich answers roughly. Finally, a man that has friends must show himself how? Friendly. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. I want you to be friends. Favor. Can you be friends, Chile? Eh? Would you like to befriend him? Let him be your friend. Chile. That's a friend. Eh? That's a friend. Friendship is the first thing to build in marriage. Friendship. Some of you, once you married your wife, you are no more friends. You were friends before you married. But as soon as you got married, friendship has finished. Say, look, no, 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 I'm husband. Husband, call me husband. <laughs> we used to be friends. And some of us who are going up and down before, you know, eating granite up and down, going to preach in the village. How does marriage change it? It bothers me that some of you are even classmates when you were in school. Now, you are married. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Change of nomenclature. Forget that. Forget that. Excuse me. Friends. Now, he who will have friends must do what? Make himself friendly. Can you make yourself friendly? Friendly. There's nothing big in cracking jokes. Hallelujah. Eh? You have been in our house. You live with me for years. We are friends. We are friends. We crack joke. This is not, life is not as difficult as we are thinking. Eh? <laughs> calm down. Calm down. Man of God, calm down. Life is not like that. How can't you sit down? Call for granite and eat. Mwagari. Yes, now. Nah. There's no problem about that. Friends. Don't make everything giri, 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 giri. Don't intimidate each other with prayer. Sometimes some of you, you are just spiritualizing nothing. 
Your wife is asking you, saying, I'll pray about it, I'll pray about it. What is the meaning of that? Can't you be friends? When she speaks bad English, she says, no, 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 mark your words. Are you speaking past tense or past perfect or present tense? Abba. Are we not friends again? Are we not friends? He who has, will have friends must make himself how? Friendly. Please be friends. But now, there is a friend. There is a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what needless pain we Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't carry. We do not carry everything to God in prayer. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There's a friend. I want to talk to you about that friend, Jesus. Is the one that sticks closer than anyone. Is the one around which your marriage is built. Please don't lose that friend. Your friendship with Jesus will be the basis of your friendship and fellowship and marriage with one another. Your personal relationship with Jesus must remain your priority. And together you are befriending him. Let him be your friend. As I conclude, I ask, there's a friend, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That friend knows all about our struggle. Some of such songs have affected me for all my years. There's not a friend like the Lord, Holy Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not with us. No, not one. And no, not one. Jesus knows all about my struggles. Hey, hey, we got it. My day is done. There is not a friend like the Lord Jesus. No, no, not one. Ah, yes, no. Brother, some of you used to have Jesus as your friend before. Something happened in between you. But I want to tell you, he is still your friend. The prodigal son thought that his father will never want to have him again. Only to be surprised that when he came back, there is still the best robe. In the wardrobe. The fatted calf is still available for this man. And there was still a ring for his hand. Shoes for his leg. Are you here this morning and you are saying, well, I cannot be his friend again. I have misbehaved so much, I don't think anybody will accept me. Let me inform you. Can I tell you something? There are times, and it bothers me. I know it. It bothers me that the friends of Jesus, Christian brothers and sisters, they are not as friendly as Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody that Jesus will welcome, the brethren will reject. Am I right? Somebody that God has forgiven, he said, I understand his trouble, let him come back. 
when he comes, the brother says, huh? Are you back? Are you serious now? Eh? You better go and settle your problem first. I want to tell you that this friend is not even like us. I've been praying, Lord, make me like Jesus. That I could be as friendly as he is with sinners. There's a friend that sticks. But now as I conclude by asking you to look unto Jesus, that friend is a friend of your family. And he sticks. And I want to say to you, if you are growing well in friendship with Jesus, your own friendship also will stick. Eh? Stick, stick to one another. What binds you together is bigger than any problem. Are you getting me? Anything that happens is nothing compared with your friendship. A friend that sticks than a brother. We will pray together. I will commend you to God. I will talk to God for you once more. My Lord Bishop has already blessed you. But I want to talk to God on your behalf. And as we pray, I don't know the condition of several homes that are here, but there's a friend that's thicker than a brother. And his name is Jesus. There's no extent to which things scattered, he can gather it. And there is no sin, no matter how terrible it is, his blood cleanses 